All right, so here it is. We're going to start talking about the heap now. So uh, previously, up until this point in the class, we have only been talking about the uh, the stack. The remote guys, they're okay with moving forward too. Sounds like it. Okay, so we're going to start talking about the heap and. Um, all of our overflows up until this point have happened on the stack. Local buffers are on the stack, but a whole lot of other stuff happens on the heap, especially in like object-oriented programming. So like overflows in C++ objects. And um, exploiting heap overflows is a lot more complicated than stack overflows. And that's because the heap is just more complicated than stack. And we're going to get into why in a second. So, um, Hopefully you guys know the basics of what's going on here. Anyone that's on any software engineering should know this. Uh, we use a stack for local variables, so like this, that password buffer and all those kind of things. Um, pretty much have to know ahead of time, not necessarily, but you pretty much have to know ahead of time what your, the size of your stack variables is kind of like a static storage area, even though you can push and pop. Uh, generally the size of their static. What do you need to like allocate memory on the fly when you have no idea ahead of time how much memory you're going to need? That's when you use the heap. So for instance, um, if you have some server and the size of memory needed is dependent on some user request, so like uh, how much, how big the file is if the user is going to upload to the server, you know, some dynamically, uh, dynamic size of memory, that's when the heap comes into play. Whenever you like don't know how big something is ahead of time, the memory has to be uh, allocated or deallocated dynamically on the fly without knowing anything about it, that's when we're talking about the heap. Uh, global variables also generally end up on the heap. That's why. Um, yeah, one of the um, one tricky thing about the heap is with these stack overflows, we're basically exploiting an x86 paradigm. So it's basically in the it's in the x86 architecture specification that whenever a call instruction happens, you push the return address on the stack. That's just the way x86 architectures work. Um, Period. With the heap, there's really no, it's not based on the architecture. Intel didn't come along and define this is how the heap works. Uh, this is something that changes system to system and program to program. Every system provides its own heap allocator, Linux, Windows, Mac, and oftentimes individual programs uh, provide their own heap allocator on top of that. And the way you exploit it, the way you exploit a heap allocator is completely dependent on the um, the heap allocator implementation that is being used for the heap currently. So it can vary wildly depending on what you're exploiting. Do you guys want a break before I go into this next statement or is everyone feeling okay? I'm going to be talking for like uh, 45 minutes straight. So I want to know how everyone is feeling before we launch the event. And the material is pretty dry. Okay, all right. Well, uh, let's take a 10 minute break. Are we going to do the FTO right problem tomorrow or at all? Or Probably skip it because usually it's a little bit um, just too involved. I mean, when I created the course, I probably created like you know, half a day is too much material. And that's just one thing to get done next, because usually by that point, people just cannot handle another like <laughs> brutal technical lab. So, and that's right at like the finish line of where I start talking about more high level stuff again, and usually people get out know, of this short thing. But all the material about how to do it, I like lay it out step by step it's in the day two slides in case you're curious. What was the GDB command? I can probably check the help, but for uh, specifying the core file? Um, just put it on the command line argument. So if you do GDB program, then space core. Okay. Yeah. And that's just because Linux is automatically naming the core dumps core. So you, you'll end up overwriting them with each other if you crash multiple applications into the same folder. Then that you can 
overwrite the lowest bid or the lowest byte on EVP that returns, you're going back into the main function. Yeah. Um, so, but now you control where in the stack you reside and since what you're passing in the command line those 256 whatever bytes are already on the stack, you control where in that instruction pointer ends up. Yeah. Yeah, so basically during the vulnerable function, um, that allows you to take control of EBP, EBP, because yeah. it's popping that saved EBP back at the EBP. And then when the main function is going to exit and doing its epilogue, it's doing move EBP, which you control, in the ESP, and then pop EFP or the return instruction. So you control ESP. So um, you control the contents of what's going to get popped off, and so you control the EFP. But setting, up, setting it up is kind of hairy. So um, the last thing I'm going to get through is basically talking about the basic heap allocator implementation. It's one that I wrote myself, so it sucks, obviously. But um, it will just give you an idea the core concepts of how heap allocators work. And then, uh, like I said before, understanding how heap allocator works is crucial to being able to exploit heap vulnerabilities. So once you know how this basic kind of toy model works, it's easier to uh, reason about how the bigger, more complicated Microsoft ones on Microsoft uh, heap allocators are working. Like exploiting something like a use after feed vulnerability, which you see in a lot of web browser exploits, requires um, surgical precision understanding of the heap allocator. That way you can manipulate things. Just so. Uh, I'll talk about that more later if I get the opportunity to. Okay. So let's talk about the heap. Man, this is dry material. I gotta get us all psyched up for this. <laughs> so goodbye, stack, you're going away for now. <laughs> Do this each time. Rule number one: a heat club. Don't talk about heat club. <laughs> number two: about heat club. Heat club grows up, not down. Okay. The heat is gonna start. We're gonna be going in this direction from now on. Sure, this is my process in Linux. Rock. This is my stack. Way up here, remember those addresses are like OXPF, FF, blah, 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 blah. So obviously very high in the address space. Down here, for our code segment, all those uh, function addresses were like 08, 04, blah, 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 blah. So this is lower end of the spectrum as well. Then right above all this we have our friend the heap. And the way that the address space works in um, Linux at least it can be different depending on the system. The heap grows up, stack grows down, and this um, it basically uses space a little bit more efficiently and kind of keeps them 
from uh, overriding each other or doing all kinds of other nasty things. They just decided this was the most efficient way to design this process address space. And as you will see, the heap addresses are also of the form 08, 04, blah, 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 generally speaking. Uh, just because they're right above here, the, uh, the text segments, the code, they're all our code in that. So, like I had mentioned, the heap is for dynamically um, adding, dynamically allocating memory. Whenever you didn't know ahead of time how much memory your process was going to need, um, you're going to use the heap for that. And um, when you allocate memory on the heap, the operating system is going to basically grow and shrink the limits of your process address space. So, Let's say that this is currently the limit of your process address space because you didn't need any more memory, and so the operating system didn't give you any more. That way, you just didn't waste as much. So right here, we'll say uh, 080410. But all of a sudden, We'll say it's the web server process. All of a sudden, you're getting attacked by anonymous. Say so you have a thousand web users connecting to your server trying to DDoS you, and so your um, web server allocates much more memory to handle all the process to handle all the new um, user requests. And uh, essentially, what happens is your operating system is expanding the limits of your process address space to, we'll say, 8042000. Then you need to do more, and it grew even more up here to 804300. And all this is the heap. You can see the heap is dynamically growing up. And uh, each one of these limits that we hit, which is basically, like I was saying, the, uh, the limit of your process address space, how much memory you have actually allocated, is called the system break. Just think of that as where. You know, that is the point of no return. That is where my process address space ends. So okay. where's the stack in relation to that? Way up here. So that the keeper is growing up. The stack is way up here going down. And the stack already has some pre-allocated, um, predefined amount of memory given to it. For every, every individual process has its own stack, right? Yes, it does. Okay. Yes. And every, every process has its own heap as well, because every uh, process in protected mode has its own 32-bit virtual address space, isolated from the other. So the stack is basically created not one continuous block, but a, a two chunks, a stack block and a heap block. Well, yeah, and even more than that, because there are other blocks going on that we're not talking about. But uh, yeah, those are two of the blocks. Okay. So, you know, the system break is basically just the, uh, the outer limits of your addressable memory in this particular segment in the heap in this sort of like dynamic memory segment. So each time you need more, it's going to go up and up and up. And um, the system break is the general terminology for kind of like the, the upper limit of, um, of your heap. And whenever you need more to handle more requests, that uh, system break moves up to give you more address space and more memory to handle whatever it is you need to handle. So, you can actually, um, I'm sure you've all seen when you program in C++ or in Linux, you use operators like new or malloc or something like that. And these, this is the, um, the special dynamic memory allocator, the heap allocator that you're using. Um, but what, you don't have to use those. I mean, you could just adjust the system break manually and tell the operating system, okay, I need more memory, so I want to manually address my, manually increase, you know, the limits of this heap segment, because uh, I know what I'm doing, so I'm just telling you manually expand it. That's totally legit. You can do that. And um, the system calls associated with that are SPRK and VRK, which is basically just 
you know, telling the operating system, okay, I need to expand the limits of my heap, uh, heap segment, my heap region, and uh, the operating system will gladly do that for you. So why not just do that, use SPRK and BRK instead of using malloc and new and all that? Well, the reason is it is horribly inefficient to tell the operating system to expand your segment address space to increase the size of your segment each time you need more memory for a number of reasons. Um, yeah, I want you to know on the screen, but you can just see if you were to like do a, a debug trace on malloc, you can see that under the hood, malloc is basically using this PRK system call as well. All these memory allocators who use malloc, etc., and Windows are using something like BRK, this um, really powerful function call which is just expanding the limits of your process address space. And malloc is just doing basically a bunch of fancy stuff on top of this to make it more efficient and faster. So, yeah, let's talk about why this is bad. So let's say we decided that those people that program malloc didn't know what they were doing. So we're just going to do it all manually ourselves. We're smarter than them. So I don't need no memory allocator. I just kind of expand my my data segment every time I need new memory. I know what I'm doing. So we do this. Let's say we got a web server, and each time a user comes in, we have to expand the uh, the segment to give ourselves more memory to handle the user. So user one connects, we create more memory. User two connects, we create more memory. User three, more memory. User four, more memory, etc. So this is going along fine. We all think we're, we think we're very clever for having done it this way. But then all of a sudden, let's say that uh, let's say that squiggly means used currently in use, which means the user is still you know connected to the HTTP server. And let's say that's not used. And this is still used. So user 1 and user 4 are still connected to our web server. The user 2 and 3 are not. They went and they downloaded you know, their email or whatever and they're done. And the problem with this is that we no longer know that these are unused. And we can't move our system break back down to give these back to the operating system. Basically, every time we expand our data segment, we have stolen memory from the system. We have stolen memory from the operating system. That is memory that can't be reclaimed. Our process has claimed it. And if we were just to keep expanding the data segment like this, the heap would become very fragmented, kind of like a hard drive. And we would have all these, uh, claimed all these regions of memory stolen from the operating system that are no longer used. So basically, we would just be horribly inefficient with, um, horribly, horribly wasteful of all this memory. We have all these unused blocks. We wouldn't know that they're there. Even if we did know they're there, we can't give them back to the operating system because this guy is still using it. If uh, this guy wasn't using it, we could just set the system break way down here, which is telling the operating system, OK, you have all these three chunks of memory back. They're yours. You can take them. But since uh, my system break is here, and I have to um, keep this guy, I have, I have to keep this memory because this guy's still using the web server, I can't move the system break back down here to give this memory back to the operating system. So basically, I have just leaked you know, these two chunks of memory. And you can imagine if you were to do this on a large scale of reallocation, your process would just end up sucking up huge amounts of data and um, you know, you'd like gridlock the system. Not to mention, it's also a very slow operation, as you can imagine, you know, systems programming, to tell the operating system to expand your process address space in this way. And it just takes the operating system a long time to accommodate you to do that. So slow and efficient all around. Do you guys understand um, the basic problem here that I'm describing with just doing with this manual brute force way of um, you know changing the limits of your process address space? So to avoid doing that, people program these fancy memory allocators, which basically keep track of those uh, free segments I was telling you about and are able to um, reissue those chunks back to the program instead of stealing more memory from the operating system. 
And that's basically the whole purpose of these allocators like uh, malloc is just to reuse the existing blocks and be smart about it. That way you steal as little memory from the operating system as possible. And so you can also um, you know, reissue these previously claimed chunks and do it in a faster way without having to expand your process address space because that's a slow operation. And having your memory allocator be fast is um, the name of the game. That's always the primary concern. Uh, speed and efficiency. Waste as little memory as possible and allocate as fast as possible. Can, does malloc necessarily call the break? Not every time. So, so if it has enough reusable stuff, it'll just... Yes. Yeah, yeah. So let's assume that here's our picture again. We're still on West River land. And uh, these two chunks of memory are unused. These ones are used because you just want to still connected. And we get old user 5 connecting here to check his email. What? If we were just um, expanding the, you know, using SPRK and those things, we would have to do this, steal more memory from the operating system. What malloc does is it says, okay, you know what? I've got these two chunks of memory right here that are free, so I'm just going to um, give the process this one because that's free. That way, I don't have to steal this other chunk from the operating system, and I don't have to take all that time changing the limits of my process address space. So behind the scenes, that's what's happening. The heap allocator is just keeping track of what's free, what's not free, you know, how big is it, stuff like that. That way it can quickly allocate and uh, free stuff and just do things as quickly and efficiently as possible. Okay. Like I said, most memory allocators are front ends for BRK, SBRK, and uh, in Windows, you also get front-ends for things like virtual alloc, which allocates huge blocks of memory, but they're always um, kind of like designer front-ends for these um, low-level, gruesome system calls. They also do things like keeping track of the size of the chunks and grouping similar size chunks uh, into buckets. That way, you know, if the user keeps requesting one size of data, he can uh, more quickly find, you know, there's like 500 allocation requests for 512 bytes. The heap allocator is going to be smart about keeping all those all, all those free and used chunks in one particular pool of memory. That way, it can handle those more efficiently. Um, lots of optimizations like that. Not too important to go into. It's just uh, you know. What you have to realize is that when you're talking about a heap allocator. Um, what you're really talking about is crazy linkless programming. Okay, heap allocators are really just really complicated linkless programming, and the linkless are just keeping track of all these uh, huge chunks and uh, free and used chunks of memory. And uh, you know, when you do a heap allocation request, it's going to traverse those linked lists to try to find one to satisfy the user's needs. That way, he doesn't have to expand the process address space and get more memory. And giving, it'll also do things like, um, heap defragmentation, that's an important, heap defragmentation, heap coalescing is an important part of the heap allocator. So uh, this is our heap again, we'll say, these are our individual heap chunks, heap, heap chunks of memory. It says blocks of memory that are allocated and free or not free by the user. And we'll say the squiggly mine heap is still in use. What the uh, heap allocator does to increase its efficiency, um, or one thing that it commonly does is whenever it sees two free blocks right next to each other, it will coalesce those blocks together to form one larger um, free chunk. And that's because um, that just defragments the heap. And you don't want a scenario where you have a lot of um, really small free chunks because smaller ones are harder to use. So let's say, for instance, these are chunks of memory. 
Each one of them is 64 bytes. As the, the user did like out malloc 64 and read, read and you know, char buff equals malloc 64 and pre buff. That happened twice. But now the, uh, the process's memory address um, requirements are expanding. It's handling more and more data and it needs, um, you know, 100 bytes. So we just got a call for malloc 100, you know. The heap allocator is using this crazy linked list programming and saying, okay, you know what, I've got these free chunks, but I can't give these to the user because they're only 64 bytes. So um, the chunk of memory has to be at least as big as the user's allocating request, and neither of these satisfy it. So if the allocator wasn't smart, it would pass those up, and it would perhaps have to you know, take more memory from the operating system, but the best uh, allocator in pretty much all allocators out there these days would say, yeah, I've got these two free ones right next to each other, so I'm just going to coalesce them into one block as 128 bytes. And I'm going to give that to the user. Because 128 is bigger than 100. You guys all follow that? Basic uh, requirements here. Um, so yeah, and behind the scenes, what's happening with all this, even though it sounds pretty simple, is crazy linked list programming. So whenever you're exploiting a heap, I like to think of it as, and sometimes some people think of it as, exploiting linked lists. So we all remember from CS Programming 101 of our college days that programming linked lists was a nightmare when we were fledged around computer science students. And this is like that on Barry Bonds amounts of steroids, all right? It's crazy. So we're going to um, talk about my memory allocator, Corey's crappy allocator, uh, pre-alpha version, whatever you want to call it. And um, understanding how that works and how its linked list works will give you better insight into how the uh, real production ones work. Because I didn't model it after um, real allocators out there. In fact, I modeled that for DL, Doug, Lee, Malloc, which is what's used for Linux. But obviously a greatly simplified version. And then eventually, tomorrow probably, we'll get to exploiting that. Okay, a um, couple properties of Corey's crappy allocator. Um, mimics the general Linux implementation of, uh, you know, malloc. So um, I'm not totally coming out of left field with this thing. It is kind of comparable to uh, the real deal out there, just a simplified version of. Allocate things quickly. It's fast and allocate. It's slow on deallocate. We'll see why. Uh, does not try to fool us anything. That's basically because I was way too lazy to program the uh, the linked list black magic voodoo involved with coalescing the free chunks. Um, I do keep track of free chunks, so previously claimed chunks that are now that have now been freed. That way I can reissue those to the user instead of stealing more memory from the operating system with that system break system call. Okay, <coughs> so let's talk about how this thing is implemented. Uh, the core concepts here. At all times, I maintain a doubly linked list, you know, forwards and backwards pointers of all the free chunks that I have allocated to a um, system break and that are now no longer used by the user. So anything that was alloc and then dealloc, that is on a linked list. And then what happens is whenever another allocation request comes in, I traverse that linked list looking for any free chunks I have that are bigger than the user's allocation request so that I can uh, give them to the user without having to use system break again. Um, so I have a yeah, yeah, good good question. Work. What defines uh, memory as being free? Does that mean it's not allocated or is it like in use? And how does... It's free because the programmer has told you this is free. It's, because it's free because the programmer has told you free this memory chunk. So when you're doing C programming, you know, you do like malloc and free, and right. you don't do free, it's a memory leak. Yeah. So if the programmer doesn't tell you that it's not free, it ain't your fault. It's the programmer's fault. That's a memory leak. We ain't talking about, you know, Fairyland Python where the interpreter does everything for you. This is the real deal. If you make a mistake, you know, do bad. Yeah. Um, so yeah. This is not a type safe language, it's not Python or Ruby or something like that. You know, if you, if you allocate something and you don't free it, then yeah, 
That, that's the programmer's fault. Yeah, that ain't my fault at all. It's not full of uh, nice, happy things that will come and, and fix our problems like Java or Python that keep track of all this for us. And this is this is why C is faster, because you know the programmer is responsible for doing all this on on their own. They don't rely on something like Python or Ruby to keep track of this um, themselves. So a little pinch on that. Um, Meta information about the pre trunks. Okay. Let me draw a picture of this as well. Lots of pictures of Eve, lots of pictures. Okay, so I'm defining a chunk of memory as any block of memory that the, uh, the user has allocked, okay? So when I do like malloc 100, that creates a 100 byte chunk of memory. And what these chunks of memory look like is, um, I'm going to keep going upwards. We have this, this, let's say the, uh, the user mem sets a, you know, 100. What our chunk looks like then is all of this is the user data, okay? This is the user data portion of the chunk. So right now it's full of a, 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 A. What's down here is the chunk meta information. And this is how it works with the real implementations as well. In the beginning of all these chunks, it stores things like, is this chunk currently free? So, free equals zero, size equals 100. And uh, another thing it stores, Am I writing too low? Can you guys see that? Remember how I said that there's a, a doubly linked list of um, all the free chunks, right? That list is actually stored in the beginning of these chunks as well. Okay, so the, the information for that linked list is stored at the beginning of um, all these chunks on the heap. So, we have this chunk meta information, which contains basically a Boolean value. Is it free or is it not free? The size, in this case, 100 bytes. Um, and the next and the previous pointer, which point off to the previous free chunk and the next free chunk. And basically, the allocator is going to use those chunks to help traverse the heap more quickly when looking for um, free chunks when an allocation request comes in. All right? So uh, it's just important to realize that at the beginning of this memory, it's with the malloc, um, there's actually this chunk meta information. So buff actually points to right here. And at buff minus 10, points right here. So obviously I'm not returning a pointer to the chunk meta information, or else when you would use that data, you would overwrite your own chunk meta information and calamity would ensue. So, um, you know, the, the allocator is smart enough to increase the pointer a little bit to, um, so that the pointer returned to the process is pointing to this uh, you know, user writable region of the chunk. You guys got that? I know this part's a little bit crazy. And more. Yeah, I know this more. Now more. But you could theoretically just take the pointer and start to You could. And in fact, if you do an allocation, right now if you were to open up GCC and do char, char buff equals malloc 100, and then go on into a debugger and look at the address associated with buff minus OX10, you would see meta information similar to this. This is just how most of the memory allocators do it. Is that writable? Yeah, it is. So, um, you can overflow these regions, right? If you just write your program to change these by default, you know, that's not really a vulnerability because you're just on purpose, you know, changing your own chunk by information. It's like, yeah, okay, whatever. Um, but these heap chunks are contiguous to each other. So you can imagine I have another chunk starting up here. So if I was kind of overflowing this chunk, it would overwrite this, and it would overwrite this next chunk's meta information. 
Okay, so an important note there is you're not writing your overflowing your own chunk meta information. Since we're going up, we'll be overflowing the next chunk's meta information. All right? And um, by overflowing these values, you can uh, basically cause arbitrary meta execution, which we'll see later on. And, you know, uh, let's keep going with the, along with the uh, implementation description. Um, so alloc, so we always have that doubly linked list of free chunks, meta information at the beginning of the chunks like I just showed you. Every time alloc is called, we walk that linked list, which is, you know, the pointers of which are stored in the beginning of those chunks, looking for a chunk that satisfies a request. So, let's say the allocation request was for 100. There's a, a head of the list, and it would start there. It would start traversing these pointers, and it would say, is it free? Okay. If it's free, is the size greater than the size requested? If the process addressed it, requested OX80 bytes, we've requested OX100 bytes, we can't give it a chunk of only OX80 bytes. You know, it has to satisfy the other memory requirements or else you know, you're going to cause a buffer overflow just because of your implementation sucks, not because of programming is um, So yeah, traversing a linked list, is it free? Is the size big enough? If not, keep going. If it is, you know, give it to the user. Even if it's much larger than what they're requesting? Yes, yeah, uh, very insightful. <laughs> um, smart allocators, like malloc, obviously, if you requested 100 you know, 100 bytes, if you came across a chunk that was 4,000 bytes, the allocator would say, you know what, I'm saving this one for someone more important, so uh, we'll keep on moving. My allocator does not, okay? If you request one byte and it comes across a million byte chunk, it's going to say, yes, <laughs> we satisfy the requirements on you due to the process. So, um, yeah, that's, uh, you know, obviously if you're running a real memory allocator used in a production environment, you would want to be smart about stuff like that. Um, I feel bad for those, so we'll keep walking back and forth to the board. And then um, the dialog function basically just sets that one uh, bit field in the meta information to not free anymore. Free equals zero. Okay, so this is pretty much just like what I showed you before. This is a one of our chunks that we get with like a, an alloc. That's what my allocator uses, alloc and dialog, not malloc and free alloc. Yeah, this is the chunk meta information, the actual C struct. Available, size, the other side is just a 32 bit integer instead of like a Boolean one value, it doesn't matter. Um, pointers to the next free chunk and the previous free chunk. So we're storing the linked list in the beginning of the, uh, the chunk information. One question I often get asked is why do they store the chunk? The, the link list pointers in the beginning of the chunk. It's a little bit strange. You could just store this out of band, kind of, in your own um, your own you know link list that's not stored in the chunk meta information. And the reason is just for uh, size and space efficiency, because memory allocators are usually pretty smart about putting this stuff in the uh, the regions of data that are currently not being used. So it just comes down to space efficiency. So. Um, Memory allocators are all about being space efficient. Obviously, if your whole goal in life is to allocate memory and um, be as efficient as possible with the operating system, you're also going to employ clever programming tricks like this to just um, consume the waste of less memory of the operating system, which is the uh, handling the meta information by your heat allocator. Um, so yeah, that's what the chunk looks like. Everyone has a general understanding of what's uh, what these memory chunks are, let's start at the beginning, and why I have this information here. You guys about that remote guys, do you um, follow in this okay? Okay, good. Okay, so the alloc algorithm, the allocation algorithm, like I said before, we traverse that link list. Um, if one is found to be free and a suitable size, we basically take it off the linked list. We don't want to serve up the same chunk um, to the process twice. That would cause lots of bad problems. So once we give it back to the process, uh, we have to make sure that you know it's 
we don't give it up again until the uh, programmer has marked it. <coughs> okay. Yeah. I'm a little confused about you know it's a linguist of free chunks. Yeah. So that implies that they are free or because you have a yeah. premium value to tell them. Oh, yeah, yeah, sorry. Yeah, good point. Um, so for the allocation request, that's why it's the fast alloc. I don't have to walk over all the chunks, only the free ones. Right. So uh, forget that I said check if it's free or not. It automatically knows that it's free, okay, because you're right. It's, it's, it's on the free list, so it is free. The only thing it's checking is, um, is the size suitable. Okay. Is the chunk big enough to satisfy the request? Um, in the last resort, if we have found no chunk that is big enough, to, um, to satisfy the process's memory needs, then we're just going to bite the bullet and tell the operating system, all right, look, dog, I'm sorry, but i got to get more memory from you. So um, give me another megabyte. And I know that's hurt, but i got to do it. And that's the way it works. OK, so I'll get some more stuff here. This is just. The, uh, the implementation of the heap allocator, um, the alloc function. Hopefully, you guys have all worked with C code a little bit before, but hopefully, it's uh, self explanatory even without that. It's basically just doing what I just described to you with the exception of this little alloc initialization thing, which means if it's the first alloc call ever, let's just set up some meta information like where does my heap start? The start and end are the same at this point because I um, haven't expanded the heap at all. Um, and then right here, I'm just traversing that uh, weak list of free chunks and then checking the size. Is it big enough? And if it's big enough, market is no longer available. Um, set it up to be returned to the user and then uh, unlink it from the linked list. For giving it to the user, it can no longer be on the linked list of free chunks, right? We all got that? So really not too bad. Um, ugly chunk, this should just look like uh, linked list stuff that you probably try to forget. It's just um, removing the, um, the chunk we just claimed off of the linked list by setting the previous and next pointers equal to each other. I'll talk more about that later when we get to the exploitation scenario. You just have to know the general gist of what this is doing is just taking it off the uh, off that link list. Unlink it from the list. Okay. Uh, Dialloc. I, I kind of got lazy when I was programming this because um, I want to avoid as much complicated link list programming as possible. Whenever you have a dialloc, we mark the chunk as available. That's free. We just set that one bit value to one. And then I reconstruct the whole linked list. I throw everything away that I used to know and reconstruct it all from scratch. That's because that was easier than uh, having to program the linked list code associated with this. So I basically walk over the whole linked list, or over the whole um, heap, keeping track of what chunks I've seen and whether or not they're free. And then based on what I've seen, you know, I construct my linked list. So just remember, when beyond happens, everything is basically reconstructed from scratch. Because that was easier to record your program than crazy language stuff. So but what this does is it takes, you know, um, if someone were to return the memory, it's adding it back to your link list? Yes, it is. Okay. Is there a reason why, because you said you reconstruct it, what about just tacking it on the end? Um, is there some? Because there's a lot of implementation details there that make the implementation really gruesome. Basically. All you have to know is that Dialloc reconstructs everything, but at the end of the day, once the alloc is done, you still have that linked list of uh, free chunks. That is like the uh, the invariant in the heap allocator. You always have the linked list, a double linked list of free chunks currently in the heap. Is that typical that the, the list of free chunks will be in contiguous order that they are in memory? Like you're uh, suggesting it. Otherwise, if you tack things onto the end, they would be your list would be jumping around. Um. It really depends. 
I know what you're saying, and they try to do pretty complicated things to keep things like in a proximity together just to make the traverse faster, more efficient, but it really depends on the implementation. They do all kinds of crazy things to try to make these just a fraction faster, which is why they're so complicated. Um, this is basically what it's called to just reconstruct the, the linked list. Basically, I delete everything I know, and I traverse over the whole heap, not just the free chunks, keep track of what's free, what's not free, and then um, rebuild the linked list based on that information. Okay. So, if you fire up your VM, you will find In the alloc directory, slash home, slash pin, slash alloc, my code for this stuff. And this just shows typical use of the heap allocator. You know, I'm allocating something. I'm deallocating and allocating and deallocating. And I even threw in this handy meta function dump heap, which just dumps all the chunk meta information whenever you call that. And it's for uh, to help us debug the heap and what's going on with it. So, use GCC to compile this, by the way, for uh, done TCC for a while. So, GCC, GCC O. Alloc user. Like so, like the file. Alloc user is the file I just showed you. The one that's just doing the simple allocations and deallocations. And alloc.c contains the actual implementation of the deep allocator that I program. And um, what you see here in this ugly colored text is uh, I actually spent a long time figuring out how to change the color of the output because I thought that you guys would like it and uh, unanimously people would hate that. So it really hurts my feelings. <laughs> so uh, we can change that later on. For now, you can just see I'm printing out some information. This is, these are all just prints that happen courtesy of the allocator. I program these printf statements into the allocation implementation just so you can have a better idea of what's going on when you perform the allocs and deallocs. So you can see heap in and heap starter now 0804A000. Um, I allocated some memory returning it to the user. The bright, awful green. It's like the, uh, the current chunks basically on the heap. And we can see uh, the memory address associated with the chunk, the size of the chunk, whether or not it's available. And then next free and previous free pointers, there are none. So this is the only uh, chunk on there. And then um, available equals one because the alloc was called on that chunk. Uh, still no values for these pointers because this is the only free chunk on the list. Um, then we can see that another allocation request comes in and it's just um, serving up that previously allocated chunk. So nothing too fancy. You guys can play around with some if you want by just editing that alloc user file, you know, performing allocations and deallocations. Like so. So yeah, uh, that's just basically the heap allocator in action. And what's going to happen is we're going to end up exploiting an overflow in the heap allocator. We're seeing how um, heap overflow is basically have, we'll have an overflow that's similar to what you saw in the stack overflow exercises, except it's going to be a lot different because we're not overwriting return address. We're going to overwrite that chunk meta information and use that to um, to cause arbitrary code execution. 
So, <clears throat> so yeah, I'm just trying to justify again that what I'm showing you guys isn't very contrived. I didn't just make this up uh, for no reason. This actually does model uh, heat allocator software. Um, as you can see, is I took this off like the DL Malloc website, and it's describing as well the chunk minute information that it uses. So it also has uh, things like size, free, and all kinds of stuff like that. Very similar to what I do. Uh, if you want to become an expert aficionado, I I would suggest that you read articles like this because, like I said before. Knowing the gruesome details of how memory allocators works is critical to being able to exploit heap overflows. And these days, a lot of overflows happen on the heap, not on the stack. Because people are, uh, programmers are more aware of overflows happening on the stack, and stack overflows are maybe a little bit easier to find than heap overflows. And um, heap overflows are growing in number a little bit more just because they're a little bit harder to find because generally, talking about global variables that are accessed in very complicated ways. So it's uh, they can just hide themselves a little bit better than if you see like string copy to a local buffer. How do people feel about the um, understanding of the impl implementation of the heap allocator? Do you guys have a basic idea of what's going on there? Yeah. Okay. All right. So yeah, I know that was really boring, guys. Thanks for sitting through it. Um, but like I said before, you just have to understand the implementation of what's going on with the allocator before you can expect to be able to hack it. Um, yeah, heap overflows are generally always harder to exploit than stack overflows. You'll get more street cred if you exploit cool heap overflows than stack overflows. That's just the way it is. Um, <coughs> you can see this was just taken off like an exploit website. There's a lot of heap overflows out there today things all over the place, and even exploiting other types of capabilities <coughs> like use after free that don't necessarily involve overflows require um, great understanding of heap allocator. So it's worth your while to know this stuff even though it's very boring. Okay, um, I think you guys are pretty tired, so it's probably a piece of stopping place for today. Um, when we come in, Tomorrow, we will start talking about how we actually uh, exploit these heap, heap allocators. And we'll go through an example where we exploit something like basic bulk and uh, get our shell to execute by exploiting a heap overflow. So yeah, uh, we'll try to meet back up here tomorrow at 8.30. That's what we're you guys. And um, if you have any questions, please feel free to stick around. And I'll try to explain more stuff about this to you. So, yeah. There you go. Day one, <laughs> you survived. For those of you that are still sticking around here, I assume that um, your curiosity hasn't been satisfied. So I'll just give you a taste of what the next lab will be, so you can think about it. Those of you that want to leave, feel free to take off. I know that you guys got to eat on. But. Um, So this looks very similar to basic bowl, right? Uh, but when I try to overflow that buffer, Buffer, you know, just like print 150 A's. Notice I don't get a crash. So um, hmm. normally, like if this is a stack overflow, we get EIP equals 4141414 in the crash. 
So for those of you that want something to think about um, tomorrow or tonight rather, think about we're trying to get Outlock user to crash uh, with an overflow like scenario like this. So I want you to overflow a chunk and then some Outlock or Dealloc later get a crash. Because one important um, rule that I'll say for this class that it's probably the most important thing you should take home is that uh, if you can hack it, you can crash it. So if there's an exploitable scenario, you can definitely cause the process to crash, right? Because if you can change EIP, you can obviously change EIP to something bogus, which is going to cause a crash. So I want you to try to crash the allocator implementation, not with bad programming, with like double frame something or double allocating something. That doesn't count. It's just like a programming mistake. But try to get it to crash uh, based on some type of overflow scenario. So overflow buff one, then maybe, or maybe have two chunks and overflow one into the other one and try to do an allocation, you know, some type of operation on the other chunk and maybe that'll cause a crash. So basically what you're going to try to do is position the heap such that an overflow in one corrupts the meta information of the other one, and then uh, allocation or deallocation on that corrupted chunk meta information is going to cause a crash. So think about that and try to do that, and um, we'll talk about you know what's going on and how to exploit that tomorrow.